Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with my business partner, Alona Koziol, and we're going to be talking about adversity in real estate because I think oftentimes on podcasts and even here on my YouTube channel, we often talk about when things go right and things are great and amazing as a real estate investor, but we often don't talk about when things go wrong or when we get thrown a bit of a curveball when it comes to real estate investing. So I want to talk to Alona about our last two transactions that we've been working on because we did face some adversity and I want to talk about those challenges. Before we get into it with Alona, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Alona, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to join me. Um, I know it's long overdue. My apologies for that, but it's great to have you here. Um, before we get into it, let's uh, tell, a li tell everyone a little bit about yourself uh, as a real estate investor and how you got to, to where you are today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Darren. Exciting to be uh, on the show and not just listening in on it. Um, yeah, my journey in real estate investing started a number of years ago. Um, I primarily focused on pre-construction investing and, and um, private lending. Uh, as you know, last year I got laid off due to COVID um, three weeks after joining Keyspire. Uh, and right after I joined Keyspire, I just started networking with a lot of investors and seeing kind of uh, where I would land. And I knew I had a, a passion for development. Um, and then you and I met and we kind of went full force into our conversion projects. And uh, we have three on the go in Toronto now, one coming up in Barrie and uh, a couple of mishaps on the way. So excited to talk to you about those today. Yeah. And let's, let's get right into it because um, I want to make sure we have time to discuss the two because they were really unique in, in the way that they came about. So let's talk about Glen Lake first. Um, Glen Lake was a, was a project that we found um, a couple months ago, but just uh, walk everyone through how that deal uh, came to us. Yeah, this deal came to us through one of our agents that we work closely with. Um, I think an important thing to note is that our agents are, are very aware of our, our model and our structure. So these type of properties come, come across our desk quite often. Um, I think once it came across our desk, we knew quickly that it was a good opportunity based off of the purchase price and um, the location and the size of the lot, et cetera. Uh, they were holding offers and we went ahead and, and submitted a bully offer and we were able to get the, get the property in our control a couple of days later. Explain what a bully offer is for people that don't know what that is. Yeah, so a bully offer is, is typically when you go in before um, an offer date is set. So typically sellers will try to set uh, an offer date to get a bidding more. Um, and a bully offer just means you're submitting your offer before that date. Yeah. And, and so after the bully offer was accepted, um, essentially now, you know, we had that property in our control. Um, and as a, any typical transaction that we're working on, we kind of, you know, started looking at financing and bringing in investors and all of the normal process and then explain what happened. Yeah. Then we got, um, and I think it came in an email, um, that uh, we were part of a lawsuit uh, against the property and the and the current sellers. Um, so what happened was this property was actually sold a year ago to a different buyer. And unfortunately that buyer was not able to close. So the seller had rightfully so kept the deposit of the previous buyers. And once we had this property under contract, the previous buyer had, um, commenced a lawsuit against not only the seller, but had put in our names as, I guess it was John and Jane Doe at the time because they didn't know who it was. Um, and yeah, it was kind of, a, that's where the process really started. And it was just the beginning. Yeah. First time I've ever been sued basically for um, just buying a property. And, and we were a little bit, um, blind to the, the previous transaction that had taken place. And, and we don't know the full story of what happened. So, you know, we're kind of speculating when we say that, you know, they didn't, they didn't close or whatever like that, but ultimately we were served with this lawsuit. And then, so what was our, what do we do then? Like, what was our, our path after you're, you know, basically sued? Yeah. So the first thing is we had to retain a lawyer um, and, and kind of with their advice, you know, we kind of stalled on a couple of things, but we couldn't stall on everything because we were told that the, the, the transaction could still close um, or it could not. 
So unfortunately, it put a pause on a lot of things. We had to, you know, we couldn't really raise money for the transactions. We didn't want to put our investors in a situation where, you know, all of a sudden now we're bringing them into a lawsuit. And, um, but at the same time, we still had to do our due diligence because there was a possibility that the transaction would close and, and it, it would still go through. So we were kind of in a tricky situation where we still wanted the property um, and there was still potential to close. However, everything else was kind of put on hold with finances and, and you know, um, getting a mortgage and, and raising private capital. So it was a little bit of a tricky situation. And for those people that have never been, had a lawsuit commenced against, we basically had to, like Alona said, hire this lawyer um, who's a criminal lawyer, essentially, not our real estate lawyer didn't deal with this transaction. So now we're dealing with this criminal lawyer, essentially defending the lawsuit, the civil case. And then we're dealing with our other lawyer who's trying to work on the closing at the same time. And I think to your point, um, you know, it was it kind of threw a wrench into everything. We, we couldn't exactly move forward on certain things, but we had to move forward with, you know, the closing and trying to get financing. And, and what ended up happening was we kind of had to move forward in our, in our own corporation, right? We had planned to bring in investors and set up a limited partnership and do all this kind of stuff, but we didn't feel comfortable, you know, bringing other investors in to say like, Hey, let's drag you all into this lawsuit. Um, and we had options, right? We could have tried to, I guess, back out of the transaction, but to your point earlier, we really wanted that property. And so we kind of had to figure out how to move forward. Um, and so we basically, worked with our corporation that was on the title and, and tried to, to apply for financing. So let's cut to um, a little bit, you know, a couple, couple weeks later and just tell everyone what, the, what was the information that we started to get from the lawyers, you know, about, you know, two weeks away from, from closing. Uh, yeah, we, we got um, word back from the lawyers that um, they they wanted to settle the case and um, they wanted to drop us, really out of, of the lawsuit, thankfully. Um, and they were going to do, uh, uh, basically, they were going to pay $150,000 into the courts. So we were going to actually close on the property. Um, and that $150,000 would be then paid into the courts. And they would basically fight it out in court amongst each other, which put us in a pretty good position because we were able to then close on the property. We were able to you know, clear our names from the lawsuit and move forward with our transaction. And as far as the, the previous buyer, they had now been able to freeze that money and, and proceed with their lawsuit against um, the sellers. Yeah. So essentially we got the word that, you know, kind of like we're a little bit in the clear, which they didn't have a case against us at all. Um, they were basically saying that the, that we were kind of I didn't read through everything. This is kind of like our lawyer's words, but they were kind of saying like the reason that we got dragged into the lawsuit in the first place is they were kind of saying that we were in cahoots with the sellers and like we were conspiring against the previous buyers to, to make this transaction happen. Um, when in fact, you know, the reality of it was that I think they just wanted to, you know, have the dispute with the, the, the sellers and kind of leave us out of it. But by dragging us into it, you know, they definitely probably, move their agenda forward, um, you know, because we were kind of putting pressure on the sellers and they were putting pressure on the sellers to, to figure out this lawsuit. So that was the, the resolution, essentially. They paid $150,000 of the, the proceeds of the sale into the, into the trust, and then they can kind of battle it out after that. And now we have a uh, clear property to the title. Doesn't a uh, clear title to the property. Doesn't mean that it wasn't a challenging closing and, and uh, all those things as they, as, as they often are, but um, at least we got through that and we now have the property and the lawsuit is essentially settled. So um, a win for us, I guess, but something that I've never experienced before and something that was definitely stressful in a lot of ways. And, you know, we were, what, $5,000 out of pocket to hire this lawyer to be able to defend something that we really shouldn't have been brought into in the first place. So definitely costs out of our pocket um, and things that, that uh, were challenging, but in, in the end, we got through them. But I wanted to talk about it because, you know, often we hear about these situations um, and uh, we wonder how people handle them. So just wanted, if it can help somebody else out, uh, might, be, might be handy. Let's shift now over to Dundas. Um, because I think this is something that I, a lot of people are going to be interested in, and that's getting into larger properties and bigger transactions. 
and um, and there's the potential to uh, make great money and have fantastic investments. There's also a possibility that those deals die halfway through the process, and that costs the person trying to pull that transaction together significant amount of money. So let's talk a little bit about, give, give a bit of the backstory on Dundas and, and what happened there. Yeah, Dundas was brought to us um, by, again, one of our agents that we work closely with. It was an, um, an exclusive deal. And it was basically just um, land at this point. So this, this property used to be a, a hotel turned into a rooming house. And then the building actually set fire. So the, the remains of the building were demolished. And at this point, when we were brought the opportunity, it was just a piece of land. So the offer was, we went in at $3 million. Um, we had about 30 business days for due diligence. Um, and I think, I don't remember how many days we had until closing, but it didn't matter because we didn't close on it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had, I think we had a total of about 90 days from beginning to end. So as a potential buyer of land, um, what kind of due diligence do you need to do on that transaction? Or what is the, if you're planning to finance that land or eventually build on it, what kind of things uh, is a lender going to ask to see? First and foremost, they're gonna to wanna to see a phase one at least. So phase one is an environmental study in which you hire an environmental company. And basically they're what they're doing is they're um, doing research in the area of potential um, cause for contamination on the land. Uh, so they want a clean bill of health, basically, for the, the land and the soil and the water, et cetera. So they look at things like, are there any dry cleaners in the area? Are there any, you know, automo automobile shops and, and things like that that could potentially contaminate the site? Um, so that's first and foremost, they want a clean phase one. And if not, then you would go in and, and have a phase two, which means they're actually drilling holes and testing soil and testing, you know, groundwater, et cetera. What else is in the due diligence phase on a, on a building like that or a lot like that? Uh, well, you're going to need an appraisal for financing, um, for sure. Um, in, in our due diligence, we, we typically engage architects, planners, uh, see what the potential is, you know, do some feasibility work to see um, what kind of building we can build there, what are the things that are around there, what, uh, what, what, what is it zoned as, first and foremost. Um, and what we can get on that on that land. And so um, obviously the environmental inspection, the appraisal need to be done, that's pretty standard. What else did we do during due diligence, uh, assuming that we were moving forward on this transaction? Um, yeah, I think the last thing is we, we typically engage our lawyers, um, considering we're, you know, that's kind of last thing on the list is if we're gonna be moving forward with the transaction, we usually draft up a limited partnership agreement. Um, and that's, you know, near the end of our due diligence uh, uh, stages, for sure. And so why, why did we, I guess, bring in the architect when we did? Uh, why did we start drafting the limited partnership when we did? Yeah, I think that um, we brought in the architect because time is of the essence. I think that we, um, we really thought that this was going to move forward. And we only have so many uh, due diligence days. And the phase one typically takes a couple of weeks and we only had a couple of weeks of due diligence. So we, we really just tried to do everything um, in the most timely manner we could. And we also, for our numbers, like to run the pro forma, we need to know what kind of building is, is possible to build there. Um, and from the feedback that we got from the architect, it seemed that the city might come back and actually tell us to build higher and, and with more density than we expected. So that would change things like the numbers and the financing and how many investors we need to bring in and all of those sorts of things. So these are all things that we need to plan um, accordingly. And it's not something that we can wait three weeks uh, into due diligence, waiting for a phase one um, to start working on. And why the, why, in the, why the lawyer, why engaging the lawyer? Yeah, I think it's important for, for us to engage a lawyer right away because like I said, we had 30 days due diligence. At this point, we're already raising money. We're having investor calls um, and the investors want to see a, a, at least a draft of a limited partnership agreement at that point before they sign off. And now, you know, we remove conditions and, and the, the money's kind of 
gone and the deposits have been made. So we really want to present our, our investors with something in writing before we sign off on condition. So give me a total of the money that was spent during the due diligence phase for each of these things. The appraisal is about, and as is a appraisal for a commercial um, transaction is about $3,000. Um, and then the phase one is another $2,800. The retainer for our architect was about $5,000 and the limited partnership agreement was about $10,000. So essentially three, six, you know, there you're 15, you know, we're uh, $21,000 into due diligence on the project. Um, and then what happens? And then we get our phase one back and it has a recommendation for a phase two based on the neighboring properties there was a, a garage right next door. Um, and as well as the, the previous building had set on fire, like I mentioned previously. And so there was possible contamination in the soil, um, which called for a phase two, which is testing of, of the soil on site. Typically a phase two environmental takes anywhere from four to six weeks, sometimes longer, depending on how many holes they need to drill. Um, and if they need, you know, if they need to put in wells and, and things of that nature, um, depends on how fast they can get locates. And there, there are a lot of different um, moving pieces in a phase two. So it could, the timeline can vary and the cost could be anywhere from 20 to $80,000. It really depends on the size of the lot and, and how much work needs to be done. So you get the environmental back saying there's a phase two recommended. Where are, where are we in the timeline at this point with due diligence? Like days away. <laughs> we're days away from having to sign off on conditions. At that point, we, you know, as we normally would, we went to our agent and asked for an extension. We needed to get an extension of about six weeks to perform a, a phase two environmental. Um, and unfortunately, the seller was not willing to give us any sort of extension. So why do you think that was? That's a good question. I don't know. I can only, you know, make some assumptions. And I think that the possibility is that the seller knew there was some contamination. Um, but from what the seller told us, he's, you know, apparently he had a lot of amazing offers on the table and uh, he didn't want to give us the time to perform the phase two. So then what were our options at that point? So our options were remove conditions and move forward with firming up the deal or walk away from the deal. You know, we talked about this quite a bit, you know, back and forth. Um, we engaged as many people as we possibly could in that, what, 24 to 48 hours that had experience with this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. What was the overarching advice that we got from, from anybody that had been in this scenario that had experience? Yeah, I think the advice was really um, what we ended up moving forward with was, you know, we we did not know the extent of the um, of the contamination in the soil, and we did not we couldn't even get a quote if our life depended on it on remediation. So we were getting ballparks anywhere from you know it could be as little as fifty thousand, it could be up to half a million dollars of remediation um, if if the contamination went off site and now we're responsible for that uh, cleanup as well. So there was really no, you know, good enough range for us to be able to make that kind of decision. And, and really at the end of the day, put our investors at risk for, for that potential cost. And there, there was a possibility that the environmental, the phase two comes back and there's nothing wrong. That was also something that was on the table too. Right. But you know, I think that without knowing that for sure, like you say, the, the potential costs um, and the unknowns around that uh, outweighed the potential for, you know, there being uh, no contamination on the site and being able to do whatever we wanted to be able to do. Um, so I guess, how did we, how did we proceed from there? You know, what was the conversation with the sellers and, and what ended up happening? Yeah, I think after we got all the advice that we could and after we did, I think we both went into full investigation mode, um, you know, from from calling the demolition company that uh, that removed all, all the debris from the fire and, and just knowing that there's there was a garage right next door. The chances were that it that it did have some sort of contamination. We just didn't know the extent of it. Um, 
and we just could not get on the same page with the seller. He would not give us an extension. And we made the, the really, really tough decision to walk away from the deal. And um, obviously, as you know, unfortunately, we, we walked away from some money as well. But um, it's just, I guess, part of, part of the, the business and, and keeping our integrity with our investors. Whose money was it? Because we had raised money to that point. We had probably about $2 million of capital committed. So who ends up paying those costs for, you know, all of these things? Uh, does that go on to the investors at that point? Or is that something that we have to take on? Yeah, that's something that we take on 100%. So all of our, we did collect deposits because we were really, really close to removing conditions on the property. We did collect some deposits from our investors. Um, all of our investors got refunded 100%. Some of them were able to move to, you know, a different opportunity. Um, but that money for our due diligence comes directly out of our pockets. And I think that's, um, you know, we have things like acquisition fees that we add on our transactions. Um, and, and sometimes we'll get asked about those, like, why do you guys charge a 2% acquisition fee on, you know, your, your project that you're doing? And not to say that it's related to, well, we charge it because we lost $10,000 on the last transaction. But I think what we, what we often lean on is just the, the amount of energy and work that is required to get a transaction like this off the ground. I mean, we spend, basically, we go full time on this, you know, both of us working probably close to 80 hours a week when we're in due diligence and when we're trying to get a transaction together. And, you know, we feel like we got to get paid for our time. There's not too many people that work for free. And, and definitely when we're dealing of transactions of this nature, that's why we charge those fees. But I think that it just kind of goes to show that sometimes we we get into those situations and it's a tough call as to whether we move forward or not but i think to your point earlier you know when we've got investor money on the table and our reputation on the line we'd rather walk away and be out of pocket twenty thousand dollars than potentially get into a transaction that 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 has um you know some serious potential downside um what is your advice to people that are maybe in the same scenario um, that might be into due diligence on a property? And, and how do you think that we could have maybe done things a little, a little, little bit differently? Yeah, I think, you know, always make decisions based on how you want to operate your business and how you want to, you know, like you said, it, you know, integrity and your reputation is number one. This is, you know, investors, very hard earned money. And I think that this is a really long-term business that we're in. Um, it's based on relationships. It's based on trust. Um, and, and really just, I think the bottom line is we make the same type of decisions with our investors money that we do with our own. And I think that if you conduct your business in that manner um, and, and really just have everybody's best interest at heart uh, and, and really lean on the people and the experts on your team and, and reach out to your peers and people that have experience um, because, you know, you never know everything. And it's always nice to reach out for those opinions and expertise and, and, and be able to make an informed, educated decision in those type of situations. So what do you suggest, Alona, for people if they have to do this, all this due diligence, in what order would you say they should do it? So appraisal, environmental, let's say engaging a lawyer, um, engaging an architect, in what order would you suggest they do that? Yeah, I think the first person I would engage uh, would be the lender because they'll typically give you a list of things that you need um, for their, for their side, typically we do larger transactions or commercial transactions, which is why we need a phase one and you might not need one. Um, the second thing is I would engage an architect. Um, and you know, for this transaction, we, we got architects advice and we paid them hourly. Um, we did, you know, end up going and, and giving a retainer to a different architect, but you can definitely call your architect and, and have them kind of run through a little bit of a feasibility study with you and see what's possible on, on the land um, or on the project that you're working on. And then, uh, you know, as far as lawyers go, if you have an agreement that you've used before, maybe that's something that you can show to your investors um, and without having to retain a lawyer for this particular transaction, we could have maybe saved some money there. Um, Luckily, this is what we do a lot of the time. So we were able to use um, the limited partnership agreement for something else. But 
yeah, try to minimize your costs that way. Um, and then the last thing would be the appraisal because it's kind of the last thing you need before you sign off. The lender is going to want it, um, but it doesn't need to be the first thing on your list for due diligence. So let's talk about one more little hiccup that happened um, at the end when we basically said, okay, we're not moving forward. Um, you know, uh, we plan to just back out, give us back our deposit and we'll go on our merry way. What happened after that? Yeah. Unfortunately, the seller would not sign the mutual release for us to get our deposit back. And <laughs> we had given a $200,000 deposit. Um, and the seller just fell off the face of the earth and apparently was traveling all of a sudden. I mean, it's COVID. Where are you really going? <laughs> um, and we waited, I think, for about 10 days to get our, our deposit back, which, you know, in my experience, is, it's never happened. And in, in our lawyer's experience and in our realtor's experience, like what is happening? So, yeah, something. Why, why is the mutual release necessary? Like, it seems weird. The transaction dies and then you just think that they could issue our money back. Why was the mutual release necessary? That's a good question. I have no idea why that's even a rule. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. But I think the ex explanation that I got is it's basically like a legal, you know, signing both parties signed to say that the transaction is not moving forward. Yeah. I don't get it because I'm like, why if we don't go past like the due diligence time is ended, the deal is dead. Why we both need to sign off and say the deal is dead um, because they basically held our feet to the fire to say like, you know, we'll give you your deposit back whenever we sign this document, which was kind of crazy. So our option at that point was to proceed a, a legal action against them to sign the mutual release, which is so crazy. But um, anyway, we, we ended up getting it done and we got our money back. And then of course we were right they didn't have a backup offer. Um, you know, they were just kind of playing hardball with us and hoping that we would firm up on the deal and move forward. And they didn't have somebody else waiting in the wings. So what was the one good piece of news that we got after we had walked away from this deal for like, I don't know, a week or so, uh, what happened with the sellers and their next buyer? Yeah. So the next buyer actually reached out to our environmental company and asked them for our phase one, which, uh, <laughs> legally they're not allowed to um give out to anybody so luckily we were able to recoup some of our money because um the the new potential buyer obviously needed a phase one for their lender and we were able to sell it i think for 75 cents on the dollar to them yeah so we got some of our money back anyway <laughs> but a win uh, is a win. <laughs> yeah but your kids are still not going to be able to go to college no, um not yet. yeah <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, Alona, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to walk everybody through that. Um, I know it's, it's going to be hugely valuable because not all real estate transactions go to plan. And sometimes we hit things that we don't expect and there's money that we have to spend. And that's all part of being a real estate investor. That's, that's all part of business in, in my perspective. Um, so thank you for, for walking us through that. If you guys enjoyed the session with Alona, do me a favor, go ahead and hit that like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenvoros.com or our new website at readydevelopments.ca. Ready is spelled R-E-D-I. Alona, thanks so much for being here, taking some time out of your day. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey. You're the best partner out there. I always appreciate you for everything you do. Um, and thanks for taking some time out of your day to, to talk with me. Thanks so much for having me.